So we're here with sure. uh, David Mikowski from the Washington yeah. Institute, Iran expert, St. Louis native, Cardinal Zealot. Um, we're Zealot so glad, is right. It's so glad to have you. Yeah. Yeah. Hebrew Academy. Yeah. 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 That's All right. Of so we're just going to ask a few questions. Bob, sure. why don't you get started? David, do you think it's appropriate for an international agreement as consequential as the Iran nuclear deal to have been decided by executive action instead of a formal treaty? It's an excellent question. It clearly would have been preferable to have a treaty. Um, the bar would have been 67 and not 34 in the Senate. Um, clearly, the votes weren't there in terms of a treaty. Uh, I think, however you look at it, it's the most consequential arms control agreement the United States uh, is engaged in. Clearly since uh, Reagan Gorbachev in 87, maybe going back to the SALT treaties in the 70s. So uh, I'm not an international legal scholar, but it seems to me something of that magnitude. In theory, there should have been a higher bar, but uh, we are where we are and we you know, have to make decisions based on the world we live in. Um, so we all know most of the Israeli political establishment has been in lockstep disapproval, but mm. we've seen these former security folks and intelligent mm. folks, intelligence officials speak up with somewhat different views, even if they acknowledge the flaws of the agreement. Where does this disconnect come from? But, well, you see, part of the problem is that the American jury is so used to Israel being split 50-50 yeah, right. that when they see numbers like 80-20, it, it takes everyone a you know, they're kind of uh, surprised by it. It's less surprising in the sense that the 50-50 has usually been on the Palestinian issue. Mm -hmm. And this is on Iran where the Israeli public feels it's been on the receiving end mm -hmm. of Iranian rockets, uh, whether it's Hezbollah rockets from the north, Hamas rockets from the south. Uh, it's a different kind of... Um, it's a different dynamic, and uh, the Israeli public, it's, for them, Iran is up close and personal in a way that for many Americans, and it's an abstraction. Mm -hmm. In terms of the experts, you know, you have to be, you know, clear. I, you know, I myself don't uh, call myself an Iran expert. I convened for the last three years a U.S.-Israel dialogue on the Iranian nuclear mm -hmm. challenge, try to find the 20 most brilliant minds I could uh, on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and that really led to the bipartisan statement, which was issued, which had, a, I think, a huge impact right. in the United States, uh, only Americans. But it was because Democrats and Republicans sat with each other. And here was a city of hyper-partisanship, and we took the most sensitive uh, national security issue, and yet we were able to reach a consensus. I say that not to burnish my own bona fides on this issue, uh, but to say, how complex it is, um, and it's hard. And I think some of the Israeli experts are people, really generals, who've, who have dealt with the Intifada on the Palestinian issue right. in the 1980s. This is a different sort of challenge. It, it requires a lot of. It's like playing six-dimensional chess. Mm -hmm. I don't claim any monopoly on wisdom. Uh, you know, tonight I'm not going to really tell people what to think. Right. I want to tell them what to think about. Mm -hmm. I want to try to present the best arguments on both sides. But so you're saying some of those voices may come from experiencing issues in right. a different era at right. a different time. Right. Yeah. Some, I mean, a guy like Ephraim Halevi, on the other hand, was a, the head of the Mossad, was definitely a regionalist. Mm -hmm. He wasn't, uh, you know, and, and so it depends. I think on this one, there's, there's, we have to be very careful. I, but I think your point about the Israeli public is, is excellent, and I think it really the the fact that the Israeli public, uh, you know, is like eighty twenty or eighty ten, and there's a ten. I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, it depends on the poll, but I think it's 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 because of the their own that they've been on the receiving end of these rockets. So mm -hmm. their views of Iran are are, are are formulated in that regard, and they're not, you know, they're they're much more unambiguous on this issue uh, than they speak on the Palestinian issue, where the country's been often. Sure. divided down the middle. In contrast to the respectful behind the scenes meetings that you convened, mm -hmm. the public rhetoric uh, in both Israel and in the United States has been, I think in my memory, is unprecedentedly harsh. Do you think there's a danger unless something is oh done God. to oh heal God. that breach of a, of a kind of a long-term breach? Yeah, absolutely. I think you put your finger on the, on the point. I, 
I was interviewed, the White House correspondent of the New York Times called me. I was interviewed in two front page pieces for them. Uh, one was the lead story, the day of Obama's speech at American University. And then they broke it out and did another piece uh, two days later on the front page. And I am very, you know, I admit I, I work for this administration. I, someone says, can you serve the cause of peace and, uh, and help your country? And, how, you know, how do you say no? Uh, so, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm no regrets. I'm glad I did it. But it also imposes a certain onus on someone who has served in the government. You know, you don't cavalierly say things. And I think in public, and I, but I felt that a line had been crossed. And I, I said that I worried that the, this debate, I said, is going off a cliff. Uh, and I thought both sides had a hand in it in different ways. Not, I'm not making equivalents. They didn't do it in the same way. Uh, I was, I had a, I'd say, a fairly uh, heated conversation, candid, uh, the other day at the White House without getting into details. Of course. Uh, I felt that a certain, what I would call a dog whistle, was heard. Now, it doesn't mean the guy who, who sounded the whistle, I can't read his mind, mm -hmm. but when you start using phrases about lawmakers, right. that, uh, that, they're, that the lobbyists are, uh, you know, they're funding uh, ads and these are the same people that take you to war, Jews are going to hear things in a certain way, because mm -hmm. historically the idea of the powerful Jews mm -hmm. um, and kind of pushing a country to war, that's very powerful. and. And, I, and in my view, in a very unfair way, and that's why I felt I had to speak out. Um, and, um, but I don't regret that, because I feel if it contributed in some way to trying to keep this debate within lines, I think it's important. Now, I want to say that I felt on, on, there have been also on the other side here, um, there's a little bit of a bunker mentality, not in the sense of equivalence of dog whistling, but in the sense of that neither side is willing to acknowledge some of the arguments of the other. Mm -hmm. And that I, I'm concerned about because, you know, having a good national debate is being able to have that exchange and to acknowledge trade-offs and acknowledge advantages. The problem is, is that when you want to win a heated political contest, you, you don't like shades of gray. You like black and white. Right. And you can say that comes with the turf kind of thing. Right. It's possible. Look, also, I think the prime minister, the people around the prime minister have to be careful. Prime minister always says, I'm not, I don't, you know, it's not personal against Barack Obama. It's a professional disagreement. He's a, he's a good friend of Israel. But there have been enough people, uh, not maybe not as close as age, but people have thrown around the Chamberlain, Munich analogy. And you could imagine that, I could tell you that anything that's set over there is hurting. In Washington, oh, yeah. here, I'm not in Washington, but it's heard in, macro, in, in nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. So the, the fact that electronic communication is so instantaneous, it seems to me, uh, imposes a certain burden that we keep this debate in bounds. Because my fear is, is that if, if it goes over the cliff, it's going to leave at least, at best, lasting scar tissue. And at worst, it's going to hurt U.S. Israel relations. So I think there's a burden on both sides to be very careful in how they frame their criticism. Mm -hmm. well David, did you have an opinion about whether going to the Security Council before the congressional vote was a good thing, bad thing, or some other kind of thing? I, I, I think that, if I'm correct, there was um, when it came to this to the war in, uh, on the Iran Iraq mm -hmm. uh, the Iran the Iraq War one the Gulf War we Correct. call it, 1990 I think they did go to the Security Council first mm -hmm. and I think when I think in, when it came to uh, 2003 we did the opposite I personally think it did, the optics did not look good um, I think you want to give the U S Congress its space to deliberate mm -hmm. and. Frankly, I think the letter, a bipartisan letter of Corker and Cardin, um, made it clear to the president that they see this as impinging on that. Uh, it, it didn't have an impact. The thing went to anyway. Uh, but I, I, I think that was not a good form, and I think that 
if you talk to people close to the White House, I think there's some regrets. You, uh, I, I have one more thing, and then Bob, sure. I'll turn it over to you. Sure. But you talked about the, the, the political versus substantive issues associated yeah. here. We saw that so interestingly, I thought, with, uh, with, with Chuck Schumer, because on the one hand, yeah. you know, he spoke out and gave the substantive reasons why he was opposed. On the other, there were those who said um, he was basically doing it to satisfy his constituency, and he knew the president had the votes to, to sustain. So is there any real way to separate out the political it's very hard to know the calculations because right. there will be people, if this, the president overrides, right. they will say, Schumer, for example, you know, knew he had a life raft with 12 <laughs> right. seats that he was going to drive the ship, and there wouldn't be a 13th. That, that's... Right. He 13 Democrats. And he saved New York. <laughs> and, and, they, and he knew who had races coming up in right. 2016. Right. Right. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of saying is the person has convictions, and once he puts out a very detailed statement, as yeah. he did, it's going to be very hard to uh, go back and forth. Look, they, you know, they might prove not to be mutually exclusive. I mean, it could be that. You know, the, there won't be an override, and uh, Schumer will be consistent in both right. a first vote and a second vote. You know, a vote to disapprove, president does his veto, and then there's a second vote. Correct. So, you know, I, I tend to think it'll be very hard to switch votes between the two votes, mm -hmm. but, you know, there will be uh, pundits who will uh, say that it's all very calculated. Since I don't know the mind of Senator Schumer, I <laughs> I, I prefer not to. Okay, David, you and your longtime colleague and sometimes co-author Dennis yeah. Ross have each been on negotiating yeah. teams, official negotiating teams in the Israel-Palestine track. Yeah. We've got two different possible scenarios that might play out. Yeah. One would be that there's so much uh, peak between the U.S. and Israel that if the uh, Abbas goes before the Security Council, that the U.S. will not exercise his veto and allow Palestine to come in as a state and a member. The other scenario would be, in order to get things back on a more amicable track, that the peace process will, on the two-state thing will be restarted. Which do you think is the more likely scenario? It's a good question. Maybe there's a third option, too, uh, which I'm happy to, to try to put forth sure, uh, an idea. Look, the first option, talk about the political as, as well as the policy critique. Once you impose a template that these are the five core issues, how they're going to be resolved, they're going to be taken as an imposed solution. And you could be sure that Prime Minister Netanyahu, the way he feels on this issue, he's certainly not going to feel any less on the Palestinian track, which deals with very emotional issues like Jerusalem and, and you know, can, can you make any modifications there? So he will come with guns blazing. And the question is also, well, what do you achieve by doing something that's going to be rejected by Netanyahu? And by the way, I would argue by the Palestinian side, who will not, the United States will come forward with something about that Israel is a nation state of the Jewish people. They will not like that. So if both sides, if you're going to get a no from both, what does it leave you with? Um, that, I think, is something the administration is wrestling with. Now, add a political consideration, which is that your Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, and you're running for election, and you have no choice but to get behind this Iran deal, which is the signature policy right. of your predecessor. You know, do you engage, uh, you know, a, a whole new front here? Uh, how does that position her? I think for a president who is very mindful of his legacy on health care, Dodd-Frank, and a bunch of other issues. I don't think he wants to put added weight on her shoulders. That would complicate her efforts mm -hmm. in 2016 mm -hmm. and um, has a lot of other fish to fry. I mean, this Iran thing is, whatever's going to happen is not going to end with Congress. It'll bleed through the election year because there'll be a lot of implementation issues that will become heavily politicized. Well, your I mean, colleague Robert Teloff wrote about that. Right, right, right. And it will, it will be a source of contention. I mean, he didn't try, Rob didn't try to highlight the Republican or Democratic side, I want to be clear, but clearly people are going to nitpick all the way through. So if you want to make sure that your legacy on domestic issues is not reversed, 
it's probably a safe bet that you're not out to complicate your successor's effort mm -hmm. in that in that bid for the Oval Office. As so, I think that the odds of of, of door number one to me are not that as high as they have appeared in some of the Washington media. Mm -hmm. uh, door number two, restoring the process is going to have a problem when we know when it's well known. Uh, there's no breaking news CNN tagline at the bottom that Netanyahu and Abbas have uh, not always exactly seen eye to eye. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you don't want process for process sake. Because it could break the, it could quickly break down into recriminations and the like that will just, you'll know, have another impasse in five minutes. So is there a door number three? And I think on that one, door number three is, is to um, see how do you maintain the viability of a two-state solution in the absence of a negotiated, uh, in, in the absence of negotiations. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, yeah. the way I would try to do it is on the settlements issue, is that say, Here's the irony. The irony is that for the most part, Netanyahu, since the start of the Kerry Initiative, has not built beyond the barrier. Mm -hmm. But for political reasons, he doesn't announce it. Right. Because he feels if he announces it, he'll get in trouble with, with the person. Bennett and those yeah. people. Yeah. So, thank you. So therefore, on one hand, Israel doesn't build, but Israel doesn't get the credit for not building. Right. <laughs> It would seem rational to me to say, okay, you're not going to build. <coughs> anyway, you also have an interest in getting Herzog and the Labor Party and the government. You've even kept the foreign minister slot open for him. Right. So why not? why not just announce the reality, which is that you're not going to build beyond the barrier, which you're not doing anyway. I'm sure he would try to get something for it by uh, trying to see areas that even Abbas says would be Israeli, um, which he told Omer in 2008, you know, that he would say, uh, that's going to be Israeli anyway. Maybe there, get some more wiggle room, because even Abbas says that's Israel. So I think there are ways that Israel could gain. I think for the United States, we would gain by maintaining the viability of a two-state outcome in the absence of negotiation. I think we would gain by, um, and we don't mix into the, their politics over there, that's their uh, prerogative, but I think clearly it would be a, a nice dividend uh, for the U.S. if there's a broader based government and not, you know, just in terms of the functioning and now it's based on one vote. Uh, that person's out of town, it's a whole crisis, coalition crisis. So I think there are gains here, and frankly, for Israel, Netanyahu said he went to the grave of Theodore Herzl, and he said, look, the status quo is not good, because we want this to be a nation state of the Jewish people, but of course with equal rights for all citizens, Jewish, not Jewish. And I think that if you want to avoid a binational reality, declaring that you don't want to build beyond the barrier would be important. It would be a way of aligning your settlement policy with a two-state outcome policy. That, to me, is door number three. Thank you. And for those who, and for those who eschew uh, negotiating with one's enemy, yeah. uh, how, much, uh, how much discussion is there uh, going on between uh, Israel and Hamas right now? Right. And, and the enemy of the enemy uh, thing? And That's, look, that you touched on a very interesting issue. I don't think we know enough right. to answer that question with certainty. I think, though, you know, what I like to say is that there's been three wars in six years, <laughs> and that the cycles are getting shorter, the war, wars are getting longer. I was in the government during that 51 days of war that was not pleasant in terms of watching the human suffering. Um, so in my view, you, you've, uh, you know, it comes a point where you just say, look, let's find a way to have a, a ceasefire in Gaza. I, I wrote a piece with a colleague of mine, Rachel Omari, in the Washington Post at the end of June, which anyone can read if they so desire, which I, I tried to say there, you know, look, uh, 
the PA needs to step up to the plate if they want to get involved. Right now they're hurt, getting hurt in the polls because according to Shikaki, Khalil Shikaki, their leading mm -hmm. pollster, Abbas looks like he's indifferent right. to the plight of Gazans. I went to Egypt on this last trip. I can't disclose the, uh, who I met with on the official capacity. I was unofficial, of course, and I was not sent by anyone. But Egypt, I think, has got an amazing role to play as the swing player. They, have a, they are you know, feared by Hamas. They are liked by Israel. And they're respected by the PA. I mean, that's an mm. unbelievable alignment of stars mm. that we never see. So if Egypt, I think what's going to end up happening is, is, to your question, if Egypt doesn't actively find a way to bring the PA into Gaza, invariably, there's, there, you're going to see what you're starting to see anyway in the op-eds of Israeli pundits and other places. People say, the heck with it all. Let's just get a de facto. Mm -hmm. Let's get an official ceasefire with Hamas and because we don't want this anymore and they don't want it anymore. I feel the downside though of that is it'll entrench Hamas further in Gaza. But at a certain point, if you're an Israeli policymaker, you're going to say, look, my first uh, priority is to, I don't want my citizens to get hit with rockets. And security, yeah. Right. And, 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 and if the PA doesn't want to step up, then what choice do I have? So I would argue that it, it, the PA needs to step up. I realize it's not simple that, as one Palestinian said to me, Hamas wants us to do three things. They want us to be the doorman for them, to get, be in charge of the exits and entrances. The ATM, you know, they want us to be the, to uh, donate international, to give out the dispense international largesse for reconstruction. And they want us to be their building contractors to rebuild the physical structures. That is not, you know, they kind of feel they, they fire the shots, call the shots. I get that, that this is not an ideal situation for the PA. But we live in a world of difficult alternatives, in which case the alternative to this would be, uh, I fear, um, a deal with Hamas. And, and I think that has implications for fracturing the Palestinian polity. But for Israelis, you might say, we have no choice if these guys aren't willing to step up. But I'm, you know, I'm trying to cope this. It's not an easy decision. The only people who are willing, you know, who would have gotten out the Hamas fighters are the Israelis. And they, the army came to the conclusion last summer it was not worth the lives of thousands of kids to go to every, uh, you know, Kasba and alleyway in, in Gaza. And that was their decision. And now we're, we're faced with the aftermath of that.